111, People v. Perkins. 134, Counsel, you want rebuttal time? I'll reserve three minutes, Your Honor. Three minutes, okay. Go ahead. Why not three minutes? Uh, I think this Court, first of all, should summarily uh, dis dispose with the uh, preservation argument. Uh, the appellate division correctly gave a short shrift. They didn't even mention anything about it. It is an antiquated argument, uh, and I'm not contending uh, that defense counsel's uh, protest was on point, but the Court's statement, uh, the Court's ruling, was on point as to what I'm arguing here, and defense counsel made it clear he wanted the evidence out. Uh, these so Judge Feldman knew exactly what yes. counsel wanted. And, yes. yes, indeed. And, mm -hmm. that, and that has consistently, uh, in, in similar cases, uh, the preservation rulings uh, have been, uh, well, these issues have been found to, preserve, to be preserved in this court, in all four of the appellate divisions. There really are no exceptions, and the people's argument is just antiquated. And, well, and why, why is that? Why I mean, did he not forfeit uh, whatever protection he has under the law by his, by his misconduct? Because not every act of misconduct, or actually let me speak to, to the specific act of misconduct, even better. This act of misconduct did not allow the police and the people uh, to choose whatever remedy they wanted and to bring in something, to do something that was prohibited and has been prohibited since, as I say in my brief, time immemorial and by statute for Well, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean it's not... Yeah, in in Jerusi, the, uh, uh, the the guy lost his the lost his right to confront the witnesses against him. This isn't this isn't a less important right than that you're talking. Yes, about. Your Honor, but uh, the court should not get lost in the difference between constitutional and non-constitutional error. That uh, difference may be addressed in the harmless error argument, but it's uh, that in uh, the right to have a uh, you know that that a witness. Uh, to confront a witness, of course, is fundamental, but... So how do you uh, cure the prejudice that, that the people suffered in this particular case that you left with a nine-month uh, uh, after-the-fact ID? Well, it also, to answer that question, one also has to look at what the police did not do. Um, we both cite, and the prosecutor below cited, this uh, series of first and second department cases, Holland, Adams, uh, Cobb, Price, and Van Hook in which the defendants <laughs> refused to participate in a lineup. And the police took action there. Now, these have not been addressed by this court, but I think we would agree uh, as to the outcome that it's not improper. The police said, you're going in that lineup, and they forced the defendants using a reasonable, a not unreasonable handcuffs. amount of force. <laughs> they yes, used restraints in, in one of the cases. Correct. Pardon me? They used restraints. I believe in one of the cases but the would you, would you that was very prejudicial. And it reminds me of, of cases where a defendant, and they are, uh, of course, rare, but where that. a defendant is shackled. Right, but you'd advocate that? Is that what you're saying? If it, is, if it is narrowly tailored to the misconduct, the problem is the remedy here was not narrowly tailored what, to the misconduct. Why isn't it a, a more reasonable approach to do what they did? A uh, more appropriate risk because this state to well, we we know, and this state's the only state in the country, right, that doesn't allow the photo IDs. But in this circumstance, rather than shackle them or handcuff them, why wasn't this an, uh, uh, an appropriate response? And again, given the the clear prejudice that the people suffer. Um, why doesn't this make kind of common sense it's an as a, as a, uh, a narrow uh, exception here in letting this in? Because the prejudice, and I'm not saying there was no, there would not have been prejudice to the people, but the prejudice is not the same as that in Jirasi, the loss of a witness. It is not the same as a, as a so defendant just, who So you just, that's it, that prejudice? Sometimes yeah. the people have to suffer a bit of prejudice so that okay. they don't violate. Would it have been any different if, for example, um, the police did this? Let's say they did it. Uh, and then comes time for trial, and you're making an application to the court as to its admissibility, the way... Can you say the police did what? Uh, what exactly the same case? thing that was done here. Okay. Um, and then you get to trial, and you make an application to the court to, to be able to use that identification. 
And what if the ruling had been, instead of the ruling we had here, but what if the ruling had been, um, you can use it only if the defendant takes the witness stand, if, if he opens the door, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to it being used in the people's direct case. Actually, the people still can use what happened, of course. The refusal is, right. is you know, can be used as consciousness of guilt. Of guilt I understand that. Yes. <clears throat> but the, the ID, I'm talking about the ID, the evidence yeah, okay. of, the of the corporeal ID, uh, or no, the photo ID. Uh, unless I'm misunderstanding your question, that's, that's what we said should have happened, that the photo right. ID should not have come in in this case. Um, are, are you asking something different? Because no, what I'm saying is the difference between using it in the direct case yes. when you have the witness on the witness stand oh, I see. I see. It, 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 and yes. using it in rebuttal or in cross-examination of a defense witness, for example, who who wants to raise the, the Yes, that goes to my opening of, um, the door argument. Yes. It's very similar. Um, and I do address that in my brief. And, of course, defense counsel in this case said, look, I'm going to be careful not to open the door. <clears throat> he said, I'm not going to uh, say that the, the uh, look how many months have passed by and why so many months have passed by is another problem with the people's, uh, people's case. They took a, a ridiculous amount of time uh, to get counsel involved and to get this defendant back into a police station or to the DA's office, wherever it took place, for an ID to happen. But uh, if defense counsel opens the door, defense counsel opens the door. There are a myriad number of opening the door cases. So it would have been fine then? As a response to uh, defense counsel's misleading argument or a defendant's misleading testimony. But not in their direct case. No, not on the direct case. What's wrong no. with the direct case? Judge? What's wrong with using the photos in the direct case? It, because photos are long understood in this uh, to be less, in, uh, to be inherently unreliable. Well, you had a Wade hearing, right? The Wade hearing uh, was to measure constitutional suggestivity. You know, and they found that these photographs were not suggestive. That's not the only measure. Uh, but the, uh, the reliability, one doesn't just argue to a jury that the ID, whatever it was, whether by photo or corporeal, was constitutionally unsuggestive. One argues, of course, in an ID case, that it's unreliable. That goes to the weight. But in terms of the admissibility, uh, there was nothing that prevented these photographs from being used, in your view, correct? Other than the fact that it's never been done before. Well, it's not just uh, that it's never been done before. It's been, never been done before pursuant to, uh, you know, a, a, a hundred-year-old or more uh, policy. That says that it makes people think that someone's in custody, because how else would the police have a picture? Not only that. Um, you know, I acknowledge uh, rather quickly, and of course the appellate division spoke of that, that there's this rogues gallery. Um, but I also mention in my case, this case, uh, a, a case of this court, People Against Griffin, uh, in which uh, the dissent said that a, um, a drawing, a, a uh, Sketch. 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 Thank you, Your Honor. A sketch, uh, you know, would not imply prior criminality, and so it was not error uh, for it to come in. But the majority said, no, there's, there's an inherent prejudice about, uh, and they equated that sketch with being a photo. And they, this court said that there's an inherent prejudice well, in that kind the, of the, evidence. The, the jury was made aware of the fact that police did not have this photograph before it was actually taken. Yes, so and that's it wasn't only in one their of the files, two. it wasn't part of the rogues gallery, etc. The jury knew that. The jury knew that, but that would have only have made a bad thing worse if the jury hadn't found that out. Uh, Caserta and other cases have held uh, that, and it has been widely accepted in this state beyond even uh, the decisions of this court, that, uh, that photo IDs are inherently unreliable and it's also widely accepted that a person who makes a photo ID whether or not that's an accurate ID uh, will pretty much stick with that ID when when they have a chance to do a corporeal ID either pre-trial or in trial so it enhances the likelihood of a corporeal misidentification if there's been a photo misidentification in the first place and the people hitch their wagon to, um, to Professors uh, Sheck and, and uh, Zeke Edwards and their testimony before the Bar Association. And they're not misleading, but the people are quite less than comprehensive uh, because, uh, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll confine my comments to, uh, to Mr. Sheck 
his testimony, but he didn't just say the time has now come for photos to be allowed. It's allowed in other states they come in. He said that uh, he referred to a grand bargain, his phrase, and he said photos should be allowed if the best practices that we also recommend, and of course none of those best practices took place uh, in, in this case, are also allowed uh, videotaping very strict scripts to which the police must, must, uh, uh, must adhere, uh, very strict uh, behavioral uh, protocols, um, and uh, conceding, conceding everything you said, I'm still not sure I understand. I mean, assuming that as you're, I'm, you're not right, under New York law, they're not entitled to use these pictures. Why can't he forfeit it by his misconduct? Because not every act of misconduct. Well, not, not, not every act, but what, what was it about this one that, what, what is about this forfeiture that, that made, uh, made it unfair? Because the police can say to him, you're going in that lineup. And the police, police are like a paramilitary organization. They, yeah, they, 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 they could have put him there in shackles, but as several of the questions suggested, why wasn't it wiser and fairer to use the pictures? I mean, you, you can't say that pictures are worse than a guy in shackles in a lineup. Because the people should not be able to choose whatever remedy they want. This is an unapproved even if they remedy. Even if they choose the fairest one available? It's not necessarily are, the first one. Are you seriously telling us if they had shackled him in the lineup, you wouldn't be standing here with a different argument on his behalf? It's, I might not have been able I mean, to make that argument. I mean, that's exceedingly prejudicial to have him standing there in shackles in the lineup. I, pursuant to Holland and these other cases, I might not have been able to make that argument at all. I can't say what I would have argued. Okay, Ken. Thank you. Your are you advocating that we change the rule altogether and say that um, we can allow the use of, of um, photo IDs in people's direct case in any case, or in this case, because of his misconduct? What's, well, I know what your preference would be, but what are you advocating in this case? In this case, in our, in our brief and here before you today, I'm arguing for simply the narrow rule. Forfeiture. Forfeiture in this case. Now, I think that this court would have the power, notwithstanding Section 6030, to create a, a broader hearsay exception for photo IDs, and I think that that so shouldn't, shouldn't we wait until it's really an issue to right. do that, until, it, until a case, we get a case that turns on it? I think you should do it right now. But <laughs> I, I, the point, the point is well taken, Your Honor, and so I'm going to really confine my argument to forfeiture. forfeiture. Now, and what's the best case for the forfeiture? The best case for forfeiture is, is uh, Jirachi, or Jirassi, however you prefer to pronounce it. It's, it's really a very analogous case to this case. In Jirassi, the defendant, by intimidating a witness, effectively pre uh, prevented him from testifying in court. And this court held that a, a defendant who does that should not be allowed to profit by his wrongdoing, and therefore the court allowed witnesses' grand jury testimony to come in. In a subsequent case, Cato, this court said it doesn't have to be prior testimony under oath. That was just, a, in Cato, it was just a series of unsworn statements to the police which this court considered to be reliable. Now, in this case... Your adversary the, claims the police could have done other things here. Yeah, they could have done other things. But let me just read to you a quotation from People Against Jones, which is 2 New York 3rd. Um, <coughs> after stating that a, a person lawfully in custody does not have a right to refuse to be in a lineup provided there's probable cause for his arrest. This court went on to say, it is the police alone who decide whether a lineup will occur, select the procedure that will be used, determine when and where the identification is held, and choose other persons who along with the suspect will be included in the lineup. And I think the point is that the police it's not up to the defendant to decide how the police are supposed to do their job. In this particular instance, by the way, the officer who testified about the lineup 
said that it was impossible that the situation was such that he just could not conduct the lineup under any circumstances because of the way the defendant was kicking, biting, refusing to face forward. And I don't believe that you want a law, a rule of law, which says that the defendant can endlessly second guess how the police choose to conduct a identification procedure when the defendant has behaved in this way. Now, the, the defendant had no right to refuse to be in this lineup. It was clear that his intent was to prevent the lineup from occurring and thereby diminish the strength of the people's case. The effect of the defendant's actions was to deprive the people of the single most reliable, clearly admissible identification available. That is to say, the prompt post-arrest corporeal lineup. Here, the, the sanction that the court imposed fairly precisely fit the, the crime as you were, the, or the conduct. The, the court said, well, you have prevented the people from obtaining a prompt admissible identification. And so the sanction, sanction of forfeiture is where the people will be allowed to present evidence of the identification procedure that occurred that day. Now, consider, if you will, what would happen if you were to rule in the defendant's favor in this case. If you were to say that the trial court erred in permitting that photo ID to come in, I think the, the defendant community would be encouraged by that decision to not participate in lineup, to be as obstreperous as this defendant was. And I think that would be a very bad result for the administration of justice. Now, as far as the claim that since time immemorial, this court has forbidden photo identifications to be admitted into evidence, well, that is certainly a general rule that has been in effect since time immemorial. But there are, after all, even under this court's or lower court's decisions, situations when photos are allowed into evidence. For example, when the defendant opens the door or when the defendant absconds. And there's even a case from this court called People v. Edmondson, which is cited in my adversary's brief. It's 75 New York 2nd, 672, in which this court permitted a video to be admitted into evidence in which it was a video canvas in which, which was shown to a injured victim at a hospital who made an ID based on that video. And this court decided that that did not violate section 6030, even though it wasn't a corporeal ID. So I think that even, even the rule that the, that photo IDs are not permitted is not a hard and fast rule. There are situations when that rule should be, that there should be exceptions to the rule. And certainly this is one of them. And again, something that has been the rule since time immemorial, there, there may be times when it's time to reconsider that rule. And I invite you to do that. I'm not, I'm going to rely on my brief for harmless error arguments as well as a preservation argument. If you have no further questions, I respectfully request that you affirm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burrell's argument that as to the slippery slope is, is utterly specious that defendants would be encouraged to, to refuse to be in lineups. This made my guy look terrible. And a defendant would have to be the biggest kind of fool just to invite this kind of view from the jury. It wouldn't happen. The other side of the slippery slope is really what's dangerous. Now the people at the very end of their brief at page 63, they acknowledge the possibility that in future cases based on misconduct that the people may seek 
uh, to bring in otherwise prohibited photo IDs based on that misconduct. But they state, they, they assert that the decision of this court would not compel any particular um, uh, outcome in a future case. Well, of course it wouldn't compel anything, but it certainly would allow it. And I think my best response to that is in my brief, the main brief at pages 32 to 33, uh, the wide-ranging implications uh, that could come of ruling in the people's favor that uh, people would say oh, a defendant is responsible for delaying a lineup. A defendant changed his appearance. He doesn't look the same anymore. Um, and it would, uh, you know, someone might ask for a hearing to discuss whether the police, uh, you know, it, it were diligent enough in searching for a defendant or to determine whether that defendant was deliberately subverting justice by uh, refusing to turn himself in. That is a slippery slope that seems to have no end. Um, and just one other matter uh, that Mr. Burrell mentioned uh, as to something Wazilewski said. I think he misstates the record uh, a bit. Wazilewski did not say that he could not put the defendant in the lineup and that it was impossible. What he said is, I tried to give him a number and I tried to take a picture of him in the lineup and he kept turning and cursing and spitting and obviously being extremely unpleasant. And Wazilewski called it a nightmare. Uh, Wazilewski made, gave no indication that um, he attempted uh, to compel this defendant to go into the line or that he enlisted uh, another MOS, another, another detective or police officer uh, to help compel this person to go into the lineup. If there's nothing further, I'll okay, rest on my argument you, brief. Thank you, Your Honor.